Some of you know I used to play field hockey. I loved my hockey. An outlet to spend, uh, spend a lot of energy on a Saturday afternoon after a week of work and family commitments. A precious time to be out with mates, hitting a ball, competing with mostly controlled aggression, enduring the battering of the body. We would finish games exhausted, often injured, blood spilt, but we relished the battle. In fact, it was so loved that to get us off the pitch was almost impossible. Pain and injuries were not going to ruin the fun. Hamstring or calf strains, you keep playing. Dislocated kneecap, well, it goes back in. Broken finger, well, you'd go off for a few minutes just until the pain plateaued, and then you'd be right to go again. But we were all the same. Nothing was going to get us off that field. And we thought of ourselves as brave and courageous. The wives and girlfriends used words like stubborn and foolish. But there was one occasion playing at our home ground in Keysborough. Something happened. Something happened that got me off the field as quick as I could. It was unbearable. For the one and only time in my over 200 game career, as much as I loved it, it wasn't worth it. What happened? Well, I'm sorry, but I'm going to save it for later. I'm sorry, sorry to do that to you, but if you're good, I'll come back to it, I promise. But we're in our series, A Walk in the Garden. And as you walk through our church garden outside, you'll see signs placed throughout. And just before you walk in the front doors, in the garden bed to your left, is a sign labelled John 3.16. John 3.16, possibly the most famous verse in the Bible, often the first one memorised and a favourite for many. And this verse is famous because it captures the gospel, the force of love of God causing a monumental shift. A shift of humanity from perishing to life. A shift that scripture describes elsewhere as adoption into a family or citizenship into a kingdom. Branches grafted into a tree. Yet John 3.16 isn't metaphor. The shift is from perishing to life. And it's a supernatural shift that we call salvation. And it's driven by one thing love. And it involves you and me. It's not some abstract concept. It's the reality of our existence. You will perish or have life. And there's no other option. And it comes down to this. Do you believe? And if you do, do you realize what you have? Eternal life. It's a challenge to truly grasp that. But may God reveal this wondrous truth to us this morning. But to work through this verse together, I want to focus on the action. Because the gospel is dynamic. It is, as I said before, a monumental shift. And we see God loved. He gave. Whoever believes will have. So let's consider these four actions, two for God and two for you and me. So let's begin. For God so loved the world. And this relationship between God and the world is quite unique. God created it, yet he didn't need it. God made something he didn't need. With eternal God, was there loneliness? Was there a void? Did God create the world to finally feel whole? Did he look on his creation and declare, you complete me? No, certainly not. The Father, Son and Spirit are and always have been perfectly whole, sufficient in their own existence, overflowing with joy in their own presence, delighting in their own infinite excellence. When Paul was in Athens, he said this of God, 
He is not served by human hands, as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. God depends on nothing. He needs nothing, and yet he created the world. Why? Well, a kind of illustration I can offer is Lego Masters. Now, many of you, I'm sure, enjoy Lego Masters on TV. Uh, it's wholesome family viewing with uh, plenty of emotion. I think we all love Brickman, and I'm sure many of you here, when Brickman tears up, then we all tear up. But it's a lot of fun. But imagine a father and son team. Father and son, without need, playing Lego. And the father comes up with the most amazing design, broad and intricate with moving parts, and the son is overjoyed at the idea. With a beaming smile on his face, the son creates and he brings into existence that design to perfection. And the father is delighted in the intelligence and power of the son. And they look upon their creation with great excitement in one another because it expresses the splendor of their being. Why did God make something he didn't need? Well, as the Father designed and the Son created and the Spirit brought to life, they made the world to express their glory. So you might say, well, of course God loved the world. The majestic mountains, the beautiful valleys, the awe-inspiring heavenly host. We read in Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. But the scandal of John 3.16 is that the world God so loved does not refer to that part of his creation. Humans made in his image to reflect his glory ever since Adam and Eve first rejected him have done nothing but belittle his glory. We don't declare it. We desecrate it. We curse him, we query his existence, and we question his character. So what does he do? He loves us. I was reading in 2 Samuel a few weeks ago a statement by King David that really impacted me. He and his household and followers were fleeing Jerusalem at the threat of his son Absalom. On the outskirts of the city, David noticed the priests with the Ark of the Covenant had joined the Exodus. And David said, Take the ark of God back into the city. If I find favor in the Lord's eyes, he will bring me back and let me see it in his dwelling place again. But if he says, I am not pleased with you, then I am ready. Let him do to me whatever seems good to him. Let him do to me whatever seems good to him. This is the attitude of a man who knows his place in creation. Do you think God needs you? Do you think you have qualities of loveliness that draw his affection? He is not pleased with us. So would you be content that God do to you whatever seems good to him? I used the word scandal a moment ago. And it's scandalous because what seems good to him to do with that very part of his world that failed to reflect his glory is to love us. J.I. Packer in his book Knowing God writes this. There was nothing whatever in the objects of his love to call it forth. Nothing in us could attract or prompt it. Love among persons is awakened by something in the beloved. But the love of God is free, spontaneous, unevoked, uncaused. No reason for his love can be given except his own sovereign good pleasure. What seems good to him is to love us, to turn his face toward us, to extend compassion and intimate affection. Why did he love us? Because he loved us. Because he loved us. So what is the nature of such love? How did he demonstrate 
his love toward us. Or for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. He gave. His love wasn't a feeling, it was an action. He gave. And the story, story we read in Genesis 22 begins with God's word to Abraham. Take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and sacrifice him. So early the next morning, he went to do just that. Abraham built an altar, arranged the wood, bound his son and set him on the wood. Taking out a knife, he began to lunge to slay his son when God intervened. Abraham, Abraham. Abraham had been willing. He proved his commitment to God and he looked up to see a ram that he sacrificed as a substitute for Isaac. And centuries later, God the Father led his only son, whom he loved, Jesus, to be bound and set upon the wood of the cross. And as the father lunged, as it were, to slay his son, there was no intervention, no looking back. The father followed through and unleashed his wrath on his one and only son. The immortal died. John 3.16 says God gave his one and only son. The word gave is quite an understatement, isn't it? I can give you something at very little cost to myself. I can give you a biscuit at morning tea, a biscuit that someone else provided and prepared, but I can give it. But how can one express the cost of what the father gave? The one with him since forever in eternal glory, sharing pure joy. The one through whom he created the world with great delight, he gave him. But how is this an expression of love toward us? Well, John 3.16 opens up that truth in the word perish. What does it mean to perish? Because it doesn't mean to die. In Luke 21, Jesus tells his followers, you will be betrayed even by parents, brothers and sisters, relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. Everyone will hate you because of me, but not a hair of your head will perish. You may be put to death, but you will not perish. Well, elsewhere, the same Greek word for perish is translated lost. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. And for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. It's the same word. Lost. Perishing. And John 3.16 implies correctly there is a group of people who are lost. Perishing. Those who don't believe in him. And two verses later, John 3.18 adds, Whoever does not believe stands condemned. To be lost is to be perishing, is to stand condemned. The world is lost. The world is perishing. The world is condemned because we fail to fulfill our purpose in his creation. John 3.19, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. That failure to live for him, to reflect his glory and instead seek our own glory through selfishness, greed, pride, lies and worse, it brings condemnation upon us. But God so loved those who were condemned that he gave his one and only son as a substitute God took the condemnation due us and placed it on his one and only son. And what did the son think of all this? Well, the attitude of King David. Let him do to me whatever seems good to him. The son was willing because he is God and he so loved the world. So why? Why did God give his one and only son, 
because he loved us. Because he loved us. Well, we've seen God loved, God gave, and now this famous verse switches to you and me. Whoever believes in him shall not perish. The third action of this incredible verse is a call to us to believe in him. I'm going to have a slight change of pace at this point. We know this verse is a beautiful picture of the gospel message, but there are a few others that are also impressive. And two examples we read a little earlier. Let's look at Ephesians 2, 4 and 5. And here you can see it uh, beneath John 3.16. I hope it comes up clearly enough, possibly a bit small, but that's all right. We'll work through it. Ephesians 2, 4 and 5. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. How good is that statement? Written by Paul, that's another one to memorize. And of course, it shares the themes with John 3.16. We see the love of God. The gospel is the outworking of the love of God. We see the Son, Christ, as central. And we see life, the result of the mighty saving work of God. And in John, we see the call to whoever believes, the action of the sinner to respond. And in Ephesians... Hmm. Well, that's different. No call to action. It talks about being made alive. And by grace you have been saved. It mentions us and things done to us. But where is what we have to do? Is something lacking? No. Ephesians 2, 4 and 5 is a wonderfully accurate description of the gospel. And let me confuse you further and compare Titus. Apologies for the the overload of text. This is a bit longer. These words of Paul are a bit longer, but very encouraging. But when the kindness and love of God our Saviour appeared, he saved us not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Saviour so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. Wow. If you want to take your scripture memorization to the next level, get that into your head. But again, we see the gospel themes. The love of God kicks it all off. Jesus Christ, again, central to the gospel message. And eternal life is the result of God's work. And the sinner just has to... It's not there either. All God's doing in this one too. Rebirth and renewal by the Spirit, being justified by His grace. This is like Ephesians. Is Is it incomplete? Again, I say no. Expressions of the gospel as solely the saving work of God, like Ephesians and Titus, and expressions describing the sinner having to act to gain salvation like John 3.16, are equally true and equally profound. So let me explain. Let's go back to that fateful day I was playing hockey out at Keysborough. And for the one and only time, I chose to leave the ground. And what I didn't tell you was that it wasn't just me. Every single player went off. We love playing this game. Nothing it seemed could tear us away. But on this occasion, it was frightfully cold. It was the depth of winter, and that's, that's normally fine. Like I say, we would endure anything. Rain, sleet, icy winds. We were enduring through this game. And then the hail started. Now, it wasn't big hailstones. No one was at risk of head injuries or concussions or anything like that. It was was small, but it was intense. And as this hail drove down upon us, 
I reckon we started to question it. Is it worth it? But in our stubbornness, I mean, in our courage, uh, no one budged. We kept playing. And then the wind blew. It was an arctic blast and the tiny hailstones went sideways. And what overcame our love for the game was the sensation on our bare legs of the relentless piercing of a thousand needles. <laughs> it was unbearable. And there was no discussion. Every player fled for shelter. Now, if a journalist was to write a headline, he could take two approaches. Players run to shelter. Or wind drives players to safety. And they'd both be true. The first highlights my conscious decision to run and the second rightly captures what was done to me. Had the wind not blown, we would have remained in our sorry state, enduring the conditions. And John 3.16 describes the gospel from that first angle. Whoever believes, the sinner acts and responds to what God gave. Ephesians and Titus take the second angle, correctly describing the gospel as an act of God. Two ways of describing the same event. And right before John 3.16, Jesus tells Nicodemus, the wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. The wind compelled me and my teammates to run that day. And so it is with the gospel. The Spirit compels sinners to believe. And if that Holy Spirit doesn't move, then we stubbornly remain lost far from shelter because we love it too much. But we know the Holy Spirit does move. We don't know where he's going and maybe he's pressing on your heart for the first time this morning. Is the wind blowing? Then believe. Will you believe God loves you and gave his son for you? It's the simplest thing to do, yet it's a mighty act of God. And perhaps you feel there's too much between you and God. It's beyond repair. There is so much in your past, so much you have done or wanted to do. Guilt you carry from the hurt you've caused or guilt you carry from what others have done. Either way, it's a mess, and you can't believe it. Surely God can't just sweep all that mess under the carpet. And you're right, he can't. He can't just sweep it under the carpet, and that's not what he does. When the Father poured out his wrath on the Son upon that cross, and the Son gave up his spirit, they were dealing with your mess. And through the pain, suffering, and death of his son Jesus, it has been dealt with. You just have to believe. Why did he make it so simple? Because he loved us. Because he loved us. So believe in him. Well, the first action in John 3.16 for you and me is to believe, and the second is to have. If you believe, then you have. Not will eventually have, or depending on other factors, might have. You have as your possession eternal life, and this truth should ignite our hearts with joy and gratitude. Now, I remember as a boy, the highlight of this phrase is the word eternal. We live forever. How good is that? But we need to be mindful that those perishing, perish eternally. The condemnation they suffer will be forever. So the contrast between the perishing and having life is not a time frame or a duration of existence. The contrast is in the nature 
and quality of that existence. Under condemnation or life in perfect relationship with eternal God in a glorious reality. Now sure, we persist for a time in these wretched bodies, failing us in health and strength. We're oppressed by our own sin and we're oppressed by the sin of others, by their selfishness, greed and corruption. But Jesus walked that path before us. And he walks with us by his spirit to comfort and strengthen us through these final trials. And we will overcome because he overcomes. We have eternal life. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. What a remarkable challenge to us this morning. To fix our eyes on what is unseen. Can you try it this week? When you wake and when you lie down, lift your eyes above the temporary afflictions of this world and fix your eyes on a place of peace, of wholeness and sparkling beauty, of no more tears, of joyful reunions, of an inheritance of heavenly glories, and fix your eyes on the resurrected Jesus himself. In John 14, Jesus tells his disciples he's going to prepare a place for you. Prepare. Take time and make ready. The one who in an instant spoke the stars into existence is preparing something for us. It's beyond us to describe, but praise God, it's not beyond us to have. So fix your eyes on what you have. And let me tell you in closing what I look forward to most. While I might be keen to survey paradise, to enjoy familiar faces, to gaze at the glories of this heavenly realm and to marvel at incomprehensible perfection. I'll just want to be with my Lord. I'll just want to set my eyes on my Saviour. And you know why? Do you know why seeing him face to face and being with him is what I want most of all? Because he loved me. Because he loved me. And he will love me forever. And he will love you forever. And that is the mystery of eternal life. And it is the truth that should fill our hearts with praise and joy all our days. This is the gospel. A force of love bringing those who believe in him to life. Whom he will continue to love forever for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life let's pray our father we fall at your feet and say thank you you have loved us in a mighty way you save us from condemnation and you give life. Thank you for inspiring the writing of verses like John 3.16 that help us understand all that you have done for us. May we respond with belief and may we rejoice each day knowing we have eternal life because you loved us. In Jesus' name, amen.